acá con ustedes. Let, let me be brief uh, because we need to keep this on seven minutes and I will try to speak slow, which is a problem. So the first thing is what you heard this morning was disruption. The, the, the presentation of 5G and the things that we are doing were very disruptive. But if you are disruptive, you have to be careful. And my job is to bring that, the concerns, where we need to be worried, that's what we need to do, how we can avoid that and how we can be inclusive, how we can be efficient and how we can innovate in these technologies, but especially taking into account uh, smallholders and the people that we are trying to, to target uh, in FAO uh, and in the work we do uh, day to day. Why? Because we know technologies are moving extremely fast. They are moving faster than we, what we believe, and we are not ready for those. The expansion of internet is enormous. In one day, a typical day in life of internet is amazing. All of you have cellular phones. It's growing, but the divide is growing also very fast. And that's where we need to be concerned and where we need to be careful. Let me just show a few statistics on the divide. In terms of the income, upper 60%, look at the difference in the bars. The light bars are the higher income. The same between young and older people, urban and rural. Everybody talks about the increase in amazing expansion of cellular phones, forget about internet. If you start looking at the statistics between urban and rural, you still find a significant divide. And then between women and men, which was presented before. So we are facing such a divide and we need to be careful. We need to find ways to minimize those risks, to minimize the increase of inequality, which is what we want to avoid. It's not just looking at poverty and hunger, but it's also looking at inequalities if we want to make the solution sustainable. And why? Because our world is a world of small farmers. 84% of agricultural holdings are smallholder based. And 40% of agricultural labor force is female. And I just put some examples of some countries in Africa and in Asia where the blue, darker blue bar shows the level of, of, of labor force employed by smallholders and the light blue, how much of the land is held by smallholders. So how we can be inclusive? How we can resolve this problem? Why? Because automatization, which is based on digital, which is the base of all automatization, is moving very fast. It's moving very fast for large holders. We have amazing things now in, in, this, in, in Brazil, for example, in developed countries, uh, on how technology can be used, precision farming, horizontal and vertical farming. We have technology today that we can pinpoint the wheat, the technology of Blue River that was sold uh, to John Deere. I can pinpoint now the wheat and kill the wheat, even in high value commodities, in organic commodities. That's amazing, but th those are not scale neutral. The larger I am, I can use them. The smaller I am, I cannot, and that's a problem for us. Although technology is also starting to think to be scale neutral, this little graph in the top, small robots automatization that allows me to do soil testing, for example, is starting to appear and could allow me to have a Uber robot, for example, in the future. We have Uber tractor today. But we need to move into that. We need to find solutions to be able to be there and to achieve that. So there are three things that I want to talk very fast. Access, cost, adaptability, content, which we normally forget, and capability. Let me start with the cost. I assume all of you have a cellular phone. Now, if I ask how many of you live in $1 a day, I assume nobody will do that. If I ask you how many of you live in $2 a day, all of you live, live over $2 a day. This is a graph that shows for a package of prepaid internet how much I can afford with my income. And the blue area, moving farther to the poorest quantiles or decils, shows that most of the poorest people won't be able to access to that prepaid package, which is normally pretty expensive. That's a constraint of access, and we need to look at it carefully. This is for the case of Brazil. When we look at the biases, we look that there is a productivity bias. The most productive are the ones with access. We look like there is a skill bias, and we also look that there is a voice bias. So the more developed countries are the ones that have more access to these technologies. So to be able to benefit from it, we need to think on the complements. And the complements was what was mentioned before. We need to have good regulatory agencies that will allow us to have innovation, efficiency, and inclusion. If not, we will end in concentration, very few players, huge inequalities, and control. So our job is to identify which are those complements and how we can help governments to set that up in advance. We cannot wait until the technology happens. We have to do it now. I start now to be able to approach there. If not, the technology will jump over us. And that is what is happening today, and that's why we need to be so careful uh, today. Now, if we look at these complements and how they evolve, the green 
are the developed countries, and the dark are the low-income countries. Look at the trend. It's very clear. The low-income countries are very far from what we are supposed to be. But we can leapfrog, as it was mentioned before. Let's learn from what has happened in developed countries, in southern countries, in Latin America, for example, there has been a huge investment in innovation in terms of regulatory mechanisms. South Korea is the lead in regulatory institutions. We should learn from them to be able to leapfrog and to be ready. So our job is to transfer those technologies, that knowledge, those institutions, to be able to achieve that. On content, there is a lot of a marvelous things that you will hear in the next two days for extension, for market information, for policy environment, and so on and so forth. I spent a part of my life looking at all the literature on content and impact evaluations in terms of the quality of the content of the, of the information systems, for example, in prices, on extension. And we couldn't find very few cases that were really successful, really well evaluated. Why? Because I was giving information that didn't matter to that farmer. I was giving them prices of varieties they didn't produce. I was giving them prices of the wholesale market in the capital. And they didn't care about it. They care about the local market. So let's focus on content to be able to make them inclusive for them. Capability is central. Why? Because we have a huge illiteracy rate. It's like if I tell you today, close your eyes, will you be able to read what I have in front? No. And most of the rural farmers in developing countries have high levels of illiteracy. Forget about numeric literacy. They don't know how to read and write. And that will take years to resolve. Of course, one option is to work with the younger generations and to bridge that gap. But we need to start thinking in that way to be able to give access to them and to avoid these type of levels of exclusion that will end in inequality. Why? Because the jobs of the future and the opportunities for this youth labor that we said in Africa, for example, there's enormous labor because of urbanization, youth labor, we need to train them now so that they can be providers of these services of automatization of digital technology, so that they are ready for that tomorrow when the technology approach. And the technology is moving extremely fast. And if we look at the human capital index, for example, of the World Bank today, we will see that we are at 50% of what we should be in terms of the capability of the younger generations when they are 18 years old. And that's taking all the world. If we take only developing countries, and especially low-income countries, the gap is even bad, worse. So the message that I want to leave is we need to invest, and we need to be ready, and we need to leapfrog on that too. It's not only on the technology. And although technology is marvelous, we need to be careful. If not, we will end in a worse situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for, for the question. So on, on the issue of access and cost, which is central, and the example I give is an idea of a prepaid package, which basically most poor people live on prepaid phones, not in postpaid phones, and you see the gap. It's enormous. It's all the red area. Now, what we can do, uh, and that's the institutional part. There are best practices in the world, like what happened in many Latin American countries, which was cross-subsidies. So basically, you put a tax to the revenues of the urban sector, and you use that money as a minimum subsidy for competitive bids for the rural areas so that you can cover part of those costs to allow expansion of the network. And then you can also allow mechanisms in which you can have better pricing mechanism. The other option is to bring other types of technologies. So cellular phones is not the most cost-effective technology. Telephony by IP is cheaper. The voice doesn't compete with data. It's zero cost, zero marginal cost. But there is a barrier of entry. Again, regulatory mechanisms in place, institutions in place, could help to create that mechanism to allow IP telephony to be more popular through radios rather than through cellular devices. So we need to find innovations, but we need to strengthen institutions in, in, in developing countries to be able to, to achieve that. In terms of the, of the cyclones in Mozambique and the access to public goods, I, I think that's really important. And, and, and the problem is not only to launch a, a portal where I put an app which says it's public good, you can access to it. The, the problem, and that responds to the other question in terms of, of how we are sure that the farmers know about it, is that we are sure that the content is what the farmers need. In my work on, on cellular phones and prices in, in the world, I found that, for example, in India for potato farmers, the price information had nothing to do with what the farmers needed. And the only way to do that is basically to access to them and to try to understand what is the information and the quality of information they need in place. And then is when it becomes a public good because then people will care about it, and then they will start using it. Uh, so I think we need to reduce the symmetry of information between the demand and the supply so that we can uh, achieve that. Of course, anything related to emergencies should be a public good. Uh, we need to find ways to resolve that, and, and many countries have, have done that. So we need to learn uh, South-South uh, to, to be able uh, to, to do that. 
Uh, and in terms of, of, of big data, again, it's blockchain technology. All these technologies that we have today are to reduce asymmetry of information. And we need to find ways to assure privacy, but at the same time to give access to information. But if we have this literacy problem, how do you expect a farmer will know how to process this information? And that's the value added that our institutions and governments have to play a gap. That's a, a market failure. That's something that the private sector won't do by itself because it's not profitable for them. We need to work with them to process that information so that small farmers and, and people which are excluded can have access to it.